live. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second of two voice panels this weekend. Uh, I'm Bonnie Bogovich. I'm happy to moderate this fabulous group of panelists. And we're going to be talking about arranging for voice, uh, prep to pipes, and chords to chords. Get it? Ha. Lots of puns are coming. Get ready. They're going to be horrible. So uh, <laughs> just a quick introduction. Intro introduction. I do voice for a living. Uh, I'm Bonnie Bogovich. You might know me. Like in introduction. The <laughs> introduction. This now a proper introduction. Uh, Bonnie Bogovich is me. You're a very weary yet excited uh, moderator. Uh, I'm known in the VGM community for doing a lot of crazy things with human voices, but also in the last couple of years, also with chickens. Uh, I'm one of the ringleaders of the Block Choir, which is a Muppet inspired chicken chorus that does VGM tunes. Um, I also perform in a lot of community opera projects. Um, my day job is working in video games. So I also arrange vocals and do sound design and voice acting for indie and AAA products, education materials and audio dramas and voice falls into almost everything I do, whether it's used in background ambience, uh, whether it's an epic part of a soundtrack or just fun because, oh man, I've been a choir junkie since I've been a little kid, but that's just me. Uh, let's pass down the introductions. Uh, Julia. Hello everyone. I'm Julia Henderson. I'm a musician and music technologist, if that's even a job, but that's a job. Sure. Sure. A job. <laughs> uh, I'm from Canada and um, I've got an undergraduate in classical voice performance, but a graduate degree in music technology. Yay. Um, <laughs> I also have music well, tech I, degree. Woo, woo. Woo. Uh, I arrange <laughs> voice mostly for, for myself, either solo or kind of like multi-tracked versions of myself, but sometimes for others as well. Um, but I also sing similarly either solo or multi-tracked choral stuff uh for other people mm -hmm. like arrangements and compositions quite often um so hopefully that allows me to provide kind of a bit of a multifaceted perspective for yeah. perspective yeah and we are glad to have you my goodness you. and yay it's all i'm always happy that i'm not the only person in the world with a music technology degree they are real and they do mean something. They are real. <laughs> they are real. We're little unicorns. Uh, Liz Rischel. Hi, uh, I'm Liz Rischel. Um, my background is in classical opera style. Um, I do a lot of stuff with uh, Materia Collective from time to time. Bonnie and I are founding members of Super Smash Opera, um, along with I know a few people in this in this uh, chat. So <laughs> yeah, my Super Smash Opera peeps. Um, we worked on the zombie opera together and we did um, and, a, and another opera that is displayed sort of behind you right now. Oh, yeah. Working <laughs> on a steampunk opera uh, um, And I've done vocal arranging with Bonnie, kind of um, assisting with some block choir stuff and some other things that haven't come out yet. And uh, the occasional choral piece for, like, did one for my wedding. Woohoo! Uh, fun stuff like that. So yeah. my day job is I'm a costumer for film. Um, so that's what I'm kind of in the middle of right now as well. Uh, Yay. Cool. Uh, let's, gonna do, let's do another L. Laura. All right. My name is Laura Travia. <laughs> um, I'm a, a, rec a recording artist for uh, video games and film soundtracks, but I also have a correlating career as a liturgical musician and church music director. Um, so a lot of my choral work is um, multi-tracking the way Julia described um, with uh, multi-tracking my own voice for video game projects or like personal, you know, arrangement projects, but also a lot of choral arranging for uh, like various levels of choral groups, depending on like, you know, uh, community church choirs often have like different levels of experience and capability and stuff like that. So I'm often rearranging music for like the skill level of those groups, but I also do a lot of choral arranging for um, for uh, video game projects as well and uh, like arrangement concerts and so on. So got a, a wide breadth of like uh, different levels of like mm -hmm. difficulty in choral arranging and so on. And one great example, some of you may have caught a very epic concert that happened yesterday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Paper, Paper Mario was uh, under, under the reins. So that is a good example of using choir in various forms, I would say. And again. Bra bravo again. <laughs> uh, next, Thank let's you. see. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Annie? Tell us about yourself. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> my name is Annie Rosen, a.k.a. Mezzo Carattere. Um, I am a professional operatic soloist. Uh, Pre-pandemic, that was my full-time job. I hope it will be again someday. Um, I come to video game music very heavily from the 
vocal end of the spectrum and very low from the tech end of the spectrum. So all y'all are going to have to take care of that bit. Um, I've also done a fair <laughs> amount of choral performing. <laughs> Uh, a fair amount of choral performing with um, Materia folks and other gay music scene folks. Um, and a little bit of choral and solo arranging too. Cool. And Jay. Hi, everyone. With the fan <laughs> winning, the, winning the award for the most uh, rain rainbow epic like music video background of all of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I do I do love uh, flamboyant colors, I guess. So <laughs> <laughs> hi everybody, my name's Dan. I'm a singer, songwriter. Um, kind of like Julia Henderson. I do uh, vocal arrangements, but more like for myself. And uh, I love performing rock songs or you know acoustic songs and i do love participating in choir projects i i think i've had a chance to work on some of your tracks bonnie uh, yeah with your rock <laughs> choir so that's been yeah always and a, i a, and i got to be on one of your what was the last one we did where we were spinning around in the backyard that was fun <laughs> yeah yes the banjo, the banjo kazooie, kazooie. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. so um i've got a degree in uh, media and communication so um, a lot what I do, it combines sort of like the visual with the audio. So that's kind of, uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I really specialize in, I guess. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Wow. happy to be here. <laughs> Great. Oh man. And uh, I realized everyone said they're awesome degrees. And it, so, and I forgot to say that I went to college too. If it matters, <laughs> uh, I have a music technology bachelor's degree in composition yay music tech but also a master's in multimedia and like you jay i also do a ton of i i love the final product being something that you can make a cool music video out of so mm -hmm. i'm with you on the final mm -hmm. splashy hey hey project is always a nice goal uh so mm -hmm. also with paper mario is a wonderful example <laughs> yes gosh amazing. my god like, we're all still like a <laughs> mind boggle laura can we it's just make the incredible. panel about gushing about the no i'm just kidding yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i would <laughs> Uh, change of there, plans, are, there are many elements yeah. of things you brought up there's a great for those of you who missed Alora's talk which was what like two hours ago she broke down the behind the scenes yeah, and that's... there are some really good tips on managing a large-scale project in there i'm hoping we can pick oh, some of those out <laughs> during this discussion like air table question mark today that came up um but yeah like <laughs> let's kick off with this is a this is not about paper mario this is about ranging for singers uh liz helped yeah. us put together some bullet points so let's hit up some of these topics okay, um, i think we began so, talking about technicals yeah. technicals um, like how do you set up uh for a choir how do how what are you expected to give your singers um when you have your piece and you want them to record from a distance and uh in this in these speaking in these different times that we've all learned to adapt to and but yeah for some of us we've also learned to uh, record from home before the pandemic even kicked in because a lot of us don't live anywhere near each other and have sung on projects for each other but it does take organization to make things work properly um but yeah this is not the normal way right so what are things that we got to watch out for anyone want to take off on how you normally start a package. I know for me, Google Drive is a lifesaver and I always believe in a folder system that everyone can navigate easily. And giving your singers as much prep, knowing that you can, you are not physically there, waving your arms in front of them and giving them notes. So how do you do that digitally? Um, By the time you get their track back, it's too late. So you have to prepare <laughs> yep. them properly. Um, yeah, you can always provide like a literal conductor track. Um, we were talking before about like guides and, and not just in your score because not, and not everyone reads scores as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. Like, and singers do work quite well by listening and mimicking. So whatever you can do to be as specific as possible with how you even want a particular vowel to be shaped, because like mm -hmm. we've written here, like not all vowels, are the same <laughs> not, all, not all a's and o's and ah's yeah, are the right. same um one great example liz if you if i know we whenever we had our prep talk uh you and i worked on a piece recently that we can't say what it was but it involved a lot of non words that were all vowels and yeah. you had a very specific way to approach that um so yeah definitely that with when writing for music video game music, uh, you're not always allowed to write lyrics to go with it. Sometimes you just have to write um, scat 
kind of thing. <laughs> but but people's uh, people's definition, as as Julia mentioned, of an awe is not the same. Um, it can be really helpful to record just just a guide, uh, an MP3 or something of you talking right now. Like, just as I'm talking to you and say, this is how I want you to say, ah, not ah, not ah, but ah, oh, he. And when you see them written this way phonetically, then you'll know to go approach it this way. And and hopefully you'll get some synchronicity between your singers um, that way when you when you say, uh, when you see a h a h, give it a little ha, 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 instead of ha, 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 you know, everybody, <laughs> people might interpret that differently. So go ahead and, and speak through without, not, not necessarily with singing it, just speaking through the way you want it to go. Man, I love vocal guides because there's, again, there's something where you can write notes in a score and depending on the person, they might not actually understand what those things mean and even where to cut off breaths properly. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a fan of anytime someone can record a guy track where they mm-hmm. speak it all out or they do it in time. Awesome. And the same thing, also providing vocal guides. If you're singing along and you want to blend, if you have the power when you're doing an arrangement to record or have someone else record the soprano line, the alto line and everything with the cutoffs, especially if you want them to be crisp. Um, a lot of singers are now learning to import those into their own DAWs and sing with an ensemble. I know if I'm supposed to blend with someone, I'd rather hear what three other singers have done, load them up and make sure that if they have a certain tone, I'm not mimicking exactly somebody, but it's enough that we're all cohesive as a nice blob. Uh, Because there's nothing worse than the mixer getting a bunch of like 40 (laughs) sopranos and they're all cutting off in the wrong spot. All their ahs are different. You could have just stopped at 40 sopranos. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> I've got a project coming up I'm helping mix and there's only and... eight only eight sopranos and and vice versa and I'm like <laughs> oh my gosh every and I I wrote a little thing of how to make guides and I'm like okay let's this is gonna yeah, I is always feel a... oh, sorry go ahead oh, I was gonna say I always feel like if whenever somebody says submit a private link to your recording I always feel like that's very brave <laughs> don't do it because your singers let them download other people's parts and be transparent yeah. about privacy yeah. um, and be like other people will be allowed to listen to your parts just so that they can blend because that's how we sing together it's how we're trained to sing as a choir right mm-hmm. exactly a blend is such a curious thing because it can like if everyone's not blending it can make you sound very weirdly out of tune when that's actually like they yes. could be like singing on exactly the right frequency yeah. but because mm-hmm. the vowel is so different it's a very very weird acoustical phenomenon and it can totally wreck like the illusion of all the choir being in the same room because that's something that would never happen you know if everybody was singing together like you would match like even subconsciously so and- it's that's really key is like the blending and tone and all of that and there's also mm-hmm. danger where if you didn't provide the guide ahead of time saying what kind of ah you wanted and a whole bunch of people start uploading their tracks and other people are singing along, make sure that they're singing along properly before you have this cascading snowball of everyone going in the wrong mm-hmm. direction. So mm-hmm. be, be warned, yep. like, yes, the blending great, but still provide the guide so the first couple going in aren't guiding everyone incorrectly. Mm-hmm. It's a balance and it's a right. lot of prep and uh mm-hmm. also it's hard like I, i've done a couple things before where i can't record a tenor guide because uh, it's too low for me or something else and it's at least <laughs> i always try to do it anyway <laughs> so bad. Sounds horrible. Just horrible. thinking of annie like i got this yeah. guy <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, uh, i'm down there kids. well actually speaking of <laughs> who wants to weigh in on straight tone Oh God! Oh yeah. God! All right. Oh, so many feelings. So many feelings. <laughs> Not all good. You know, like Not straight tone good. is. I think it's worth mentioning that straight tone is like way easier for some singers than others, and it's not like mm-hmm. because they're bad or good. It is just different types of voice. Like mm-hmm. I like a baroque style tone, so like straight tone feels very comfortable for me, but it could feel wildly uncomfortable for like a totally different for type me. of vocal. Uh, fa. Mm-hmm. Uh, quick, 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 make sure I pronounce that properly. And can we just for anyone who's joining us that isn't as as classically trained, can we can you quickly demonstrate trait tone versus like opera versus something else? Can someone do a <laughs> other? What it's like minimal variety. Like what's a good example? Like like P A S O D O M I N. Trying to think of like a tune that I can sing. Like anything. Yeah, that, exactly. It, like it feels yeah. like the tone like, comes out no, if you're doing rock, if you're on rock or, band and it's doing this. Me. It's straight tone. Yeah. If you're doing rock mm-hmm. band. And it's like this. You're, yeah, getting, it's, you're getting into you're getting into opera and classical. And if it's here, it's the difference between like yeah, it's like oh my hero, my beloved, 
challenge. It's like, like that's the Titanic down. solos. If you remember the soundtrack from Titanic and that ha, ah, yeah. it's like perfectly yeah. straight tone the entire it's like time. Pop, pop musical kind of falls into straight tone too, depending on mm-hmm. anything you hear when someone is like, "I want this to be ethereal." That's straight tone. <laughs> oh god, <laughs> yeah, it means straight tone, <laughs> right? <laughs> the Enya. Sound- Enya. Enya. Is, there you go. Enya. Enya. Elves. <laughs> elves. All elves are straight tone. All of them. <laughs> Elves have no vibrato. Mm-hmm. So, okay. But it can be dangerous to ask a singer who can't sing with straight tone to straight tone. It's it's not yeah, always it healthy for their voice. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, because it feels like at, at least f- for myself, in certain instances, I do feel comfortable singing relatively straight. Um, but it has to be a really quite delicate, almost mm-hmm. airy flute like thing but when we're when we're in a certain style and it does need to be more full I feel like I'm holding back mm. and it's it's like yeah. it's like I the strain just required to like maintain that straight tone with the actual tone that I want mm-hmm. oh, it's, they, they counterbalance so yeah Hmm. Yeah. And there's danger too, where if you if you're writing a piece for someone uh keep in mind what actual ranges are comfortable like there's every every note is possible right everything is possible not all things sound (laughs) good and also not all notes are safe and not damaging to certain vocal cords so even for some people some notes are not possible yeah (laughs) that's true books may say it can be depending on which literature you've read but But, yeah i mean for the theoretically wanna, perfect technique this seems yeah. like a good time Robot. to talk about range versus tessitura oh yeah, yes. yeah. i was yeah. gonna say oh that the, those definitions are in particular let's talk well, about even words and tessitura words so, and tessitura. so a singer might have a certain range and then they have a certain range that that is comfortable hmm. and so like if you're like oh this singer can can sing here Let's write them up here and then let's write them way down here in the bottom of their range, you know, very soon after. Then you might not actually get their bottom range if they're warmed up to their top. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that I have a tenor range. Like, I can sing and like some high tenor Mm -hmm. stuff, but not if I'm singing high soprano. That's gone by then. Like, if Mm -hmm. I have to warm all the way up to my high soprano, then definitely recognize that there are some registers that will disappear in some of your singers once when they're in different different places. Singer singers are like the way that the apparatus works is that we're using different muscle groups to control different parts of our voice. And so if you're asking someone to switch these muscle groups so frequently oh. to your, your, it's like you're, you're, you're in the, the orchestra and you've got your, uh, berry sax and then you've got your soprano sax and then you're like swapping them every two seconds like just yeah. with a different it's, embouchure that would and everything. Hurt. it's like have it's like <laughs> yeah. if you write if you write a piece where one measure is all air and the next one is belt and the next one is air yeah. and the next one is belt you have to realize that that is might be super challenging and maybe not physically mm. possible without sounding horrible it might be a thing where the singer can record half of it and then another mm. and someone can mix it but asking for that switch can be whoo they yeah. might even have to record on different days. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I often do this. that yeah. whenever I have mm-hmm. to multi-track like anything at all. Like if I were to try to do like alto parts on the same day as soprano, like I would not, I would either lose one half of the range or the other. And you're, it's just not going to mm-hmm. sound as good. Because again, like multi-tracking is it's like, you know, a quote unquote unnatural way of singing because we're right. creating an illusion by way of recording. You would yeah. never mm-hmm. ask a singer to do something like that in live performance. So it's really important if you're like scheduling like recording days with your singer or something that mm-hmm. you got to separate that stuff out or it's not they're going to hurt themselves and and that then you don't have a singer <laughs> i was going to say they exploded <laughs> and yeah. jay jay and you actually do a lot of the rock pop belty type stuff in your stuff how do you plan out some of those sessions cuz i know sometimes you have some really good wailing like yeah stuff but do you have to it, how yeah, do, I, is there a safety pattern you have <laughs> that you do well uh, well i think uh i think in my case i um I think I've had a lot of training when it comes to belting and belting is something that you have to really be careful about because Mm -hmm. if you belt the wrong way, you can actually really damage your voice. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've had this sort of training where, uh, where I do have a very strong belt, especially in the higher tones. It's not something I can recommend people to try out without, you know, having like a, a a vocal coach nearby, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, uh, speaking of vocal coaches, I've had, um, 
Elizabeth Zaroff, who was my vocal Yay. coach for, for quite a oh, quite cool. some time. She's awesome. And, uh, she is, she is. And uh, she has been around to really kind of like guide me through this sort of process of making sure that I use my vocal cords correctly. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to belting, I tend to, you know, my, my recording sessions are either in the evening because I've had the whole day to warm up basically to, <laughs> to go really in the higher mm-hmm. notes. Right. And then the next day, early morning, almost a little bit after I've woken up, I do have another recording session for the lower notes. Yep, yep, uh, yep. Because we all we all wake up, we all wake up like. Nah. And that's, exactly, <laughs> that's low range. To, yep, that makes sense. Exactly, because you could get really, really in the lower tones, and uh, mm. and uh, it's it's something that uh, that is really hard to replicate when you're doing this live. You know, I mean, you you have to yeah, really yeah. practice for it, but yeah. it's not really something that should be encouraged so you really want to as you've all mentioned you got to write something that is kind of in a very comfortable area where the vocalist doesn't struggle in both the lower tones and in the higher tones you know you've got to find a, a good balance so to speak so I get, and i was actually thinking the more you guys talk about it has to be safe like sure you can do stuff and edit it in post but a lot of us have been in ensembles that off that sometimes perform live at things like magfest or if egm mm-hmm. together has had some live streams if you're mm-hmm. writing a really cool choral piece but your hope is eventually to have people do it in person don't write something physically impossible that people yes. will have mm-hmm. trouble replicating without uh lip syncing mm-hmm. to a pre-recorded thing yeah don't depend Just, on it yeah yeah it's like sorry go ahead <laughs> That was uh, that was <laughs> sorry I, i'm always like real super paranoid about interrupting people um so uh oh, i just lost my train of thought yeah so you don't want to you don't want to write something that's like impossible like there's there's certain cases like if you're writing like crazy electronic music and you're like essentially sampling your voice and like that's mm-hmm. one thing because it's already going to be like a manipulated sound but yeah like when it comes to like writing parts and stuff i always think that um even this even counts for like orchestral or like wind ensemble writing like you should write as though they're going to perform this live. Your parts will just be better. Like they'll just have better consideration of the voice and how it operates. And your singer will do a better job with it because it's something that will make sense to them. Like it, it, it's hard to describe it. It's like when you see like notes on a page and they like lay out in a way that like just looks sensible for the voice, you get a yeah. much more confident performance. I it think. doesn't look like this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or like yeah. a million whole notes tied together. Singer just oh needs to Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I am a firm believer that of using the choir as a polyphonic instrument. When, uh, when it comes to like arranging, especially for like video game music, where you have things, some melodies are like synth and they hop around a lot. Mm-hmm. I like to think of like, maybe my choir is a different finger on the piano. And yeah. so instead of instead of having all schlepping an entire section to go. Mm-hmm. Oh, 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 well, this oh, is where right. voice leading rules yeah. can really actually yes. quite help you because mm-hmm. There's there's some basic guidelines, you know, such as if you're if you're gonna jump up a sixth or more, make sure you're coming back down the other direction because mm-hmm. there's nothing that's more like oh, tiresome to look at even than seeing like a sixth. Let's go another, and then oh, why don't God. we go an octave, and then zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so that I this speaks to the difference the between there. Pass the melody <laughs> off. Oh, Annie. Sorry, Annie. Sorry, Annie. Annie. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I was going to say this speaks to the difference between range and tessitura, which are words we used before that some folks might not be familiar with. Let's um, define Often those. composers <laughs> will ask me what my range is when they're trying to, to write something for me or for altos, mezzos in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not that that's a bad question. It's an important question. But usually the question that they're asking and don't really know that they're asking is for my tessitura, which is a fancy word for where my voice is the most comfortable hanging out for long periods of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which um, is much more valuable information that people should really pay attention to when asking these questions. The thing about <laughs> singing is that because our instruments are made out of meat, um, yes. you can't you can't push it as far as you, you can an yes. instrument that you use your mm-hmm. body to play. Your instrument is your body. Um, yeah. So singers will have generally speaking, we'll have less stamina than most instrumentalists. Mm -hmm. Um, We can't usually record for hours and hours at a time, or if we do, we have to be like quiet afterwards. And part of what makes it easier for us to have that kind of stamina 
is when composers write music for us that sits in a place that we can kind of easily sustain exertion mm -hmm. in. Right. Yeah. Think yeah, of it yeah. like athletics, right? Like you don't want to always, always or immediately be lifting the heaviest, biggest, yeah. weirdest weights you can possibly find. You have to warm up to it. You're right. that uh, mile in six minutes, so you should another, be able to run the next mile in six minutes, too. Another way to think versus of it is, like, like sprinting versus, like, yeah. jogging. Like, yeah. you know, you can do, like, short yeah. bursts of really crazy vocal activity, but, like, it's, it would make way more sense if you were jogging most of the time and then occasionally sprinted rather than, like, the opposite way. It's, like, interval training, kind of. That's what I'm thinking about. I just wanted yeah. to be, like, busy all the whole time. Oh, also, you got to watch because I had a person who was writing a, a theme for a project and they based they actually started writing it based on uh, the I Expect You to Die where I sing the lead on, on a video game. I Expect You to Die. I accidentally wrote near the bottom of my range because at the time my voice was lower and then I ended up having like sinus surgery and stuff. And it's like literally oh, the lowest God. notes I can uh, sing. And they wrote oh. this piece based off thinking that was a comfort zone for me. And I'm like, mm. super oh. low. Can we go up a fourth? And what was nice is at least <laughs> in that situation, uh, he hadn't scored everything else out yet. So it was early enough that I could I, we got in a group call and I brought out my little plunky piano. We just kind of do, do, do and found a happier spot. But if I hadn't said something, my God, it's like, I expect you to die. It was like down there. And he had most of the notes <laughs> in the low area. I'm like, no, I don't, I, I can visit there. I don't want to live there, uh, but I can visit there. I don't, but no. Also learn where your break is. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have a break at a certain spot. If you're writing a piece and you have someone who has to shift between more of their chest voice and their high, don't hover them around <laughs> the break because it's, it's really nasty, but it's, it's that's nasty. a tricky one too. I mean, if uh -huh. you're okay, like, like half of my of cat, classical sorry. music training was like how to navigate the break. So hopefully your singer, if they know how to do that is not going to have too much trouble with it because they really balanced that break, but not everyone like can yeah. do that or likes to do that. Um, and I also wanted to add to this, the the range is one thing, the tessitura is another thing, but your voice type or in some circles your mm -hmm. fach is yet another thing because someone might have, some two, same two people might have this similar range, similar tessitura, but have a completely different tone color yeah. and a different mm -hmm. feeling. Like some voices are very light and sparkly mm -hmm. and youthful and can move and others are big and clunky and heavy and just like, huh. and, yeah. but you might sing the same notes and it's, it's completely different. So mm -hmm. this yep. is another consideration to make as well. Mm -hmm. Like a mezzo yeah. and a piano yeah. can technically sing the same part, but they're going to have very different tones depending on what right. type of mezzo they are. Yeah. 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 Hiring the it's there are as many voice. voices as there are bodies. And there's like yeah. a lot of like uh, <laughs> movement in opera right now. Like, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Annie. I heard this from my voice teacher like a year or two ago that like, Musetta is like sometimes sung by a mezzo anymore because it's like they want like a darker tone quality, which like astounded me because I was like, but I sing Musetta. You know, like it, it's like you can have any voice sing like practically anything if they if they can handle the test tour, but you're gonna get a wildly different tone and like character. And that's kind of the beauty of it is that like you can have a totally different character each time right. an opera is performed depending on the singer but um but it's a huge consideration to make when you're writing and that's why you should always listen to a vocalist's reel <laughs> before yeah. you yes. begin know what you're getting know before you're you make getting stuff. Oh, yeah yes and sometimes if you're doing having somebody do a cover recognize that they're not going to sound like the like the person who did the original oh my god version. yeah <laughs> I got so much flack for years when I was performing with uh, video games live. There was occasions when I would sing like the song from Metal Gear Solid 3, Snake Eater. And like, I'm not really a very good belter. Like I will come out and say, I can I can strategically do it, but it is not something I can, I am not Jay Han. I cannot do that for extended <laughs> periods of time. And I certainly can't do it as well. So like, I, I think there are certain types of singing that vocalists can learn to do like, again, strategically if they need to like pull it out. And, but it is not something yeah. that's like sustainable. And oh my gosh, I got so many comments online that were just like, but she doesn't sound anything like the original. And I was like, why would I? Like, we're You're completely different human beings. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, like, this is why is that bad? This is your interpretation. You're not trying to be that singer, uh, Cynthia. I, yeah, I Cynthia don't Harrell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. why can't you just go to the store, pick up a Cynthia Harrell larynx, <laughs> stick it down your throat, and make those sounds? What is <laughs> wrong with you? It's just we live in the future. This is... <laughs> Our instruments are made of meat.
Just and use they, the formant control unique. in Melodyne and just go, and then I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, it's we'll like that it version of a, <laughs> that version of Titanic where they like they did a, a shred of it and like the voice is like moving radically all over the place. Have you guys ever heard this? It's like a live version of Celine Dion singing and they just Melodyne the voice like all over the oh place. My God. It's it's actually fascinating because like they'll send her voice like way up into the stratosphere and you can see like how it would sound as a soprano. It's it's oh. fascinating. Anyway, uh, oh. tangent. Uh, back to the it, panel. Might, actually, uh, since we, we were starting to talk about belting and singing loud, uh, good things to point out for people whenever they, as the singer, are recording for choir or recording for an opera ensemble or whatever you're set to. Uh, for those who are new to this, you may not have be used to mic placement and getting to know how you sound oh, on your God. mic and how to so position weird. yourself. <laughs> um one example, we, when we had our pre-chat, so I currently sing with a live group. We use something called Jamulus to do our concerts uh, called C4, com Conductor, Composer, Choral, uh, something, some Collective. And uh, we do it oh, all live. Oh, they're, they're really fun. And we, we're always looking for more singers. We rehearse on Thursdays. And, uh, but we do it all live. <laughs> and our mics are set up and we have mini mixes going to our headsets. But as you'll watch some pieces where sopranos have to sing high notes, you'll watch in the video stream people back away and come back for certain <laughs> notes and it becomes like a little dance uh because mm. we've learned um sometimes you need the diction for depending on what the piece we're doing there's mixes of classical aleatoric and stuff but sometimes someone needs to screech on a high a and you'll watch them mm. in the like back up in their video camera and come back for the rest of the piece because we've learned how we sound on our thing but uh, uh you guys have uh, some examples of knowing mm your placement and getting used to creative positioning in your studios, depending on um, what you're doing. There's a cat, I, I'm so sorry. Luna's so in the... I try, I love We love Luna. Luna <laughs> interrupted <laughs> the other panel <laughs> yesterday too. Hi everyone. Happy VGM. <laughs> Adorable. I, so Luna. I, in a, in a performance setting, I am happy to move the mic around as much as it needs to, because you don't know how good your sound guy is at knowing what right. your loudest points are. So you kind of have to mitigate this yourself. Yeah. If you're in a studio situation or um, if you're at your own home recording, like I try not to do too much distance between parts because you are changing the amount of direct signal versus the amount of the room that you're getting. And you're essentially changing the tone. And, and when you start compositing and comp like comping, all these takes together and you're at dis different distances, it starts to sound a little wacky. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So like you could, two, two things, either like just test with what your loudest part may be and then stick your game there. But with how dynamic vocals are and how dynamic a lot of these arrangements can be, sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes yeah. if you're using certain kinds of microphones, like this kind of dynamic microphone, the quiet, the, the low parts will be too low. So mm -hmm. you, you might investigate like riding your vocal, which means like you're riding the gain as you mm -hmm. perform. So different parts get different amounts of, of gain, which mm -hmm. might be preferable than different amounts of room noise. It's yeah. a bit more consistent that way. It becomes science too. And depending on who yeah. your mixer is, if it's all done in post, because I've been on the mixing end, you need to make sure you're, if you're delivering something like that, that you give them room tone from both instances. So they mm -hmm. know what to chunk out from the quiet parts you're doing versus the loud. Because when you ride that gain, that also adjusts what that noise in the background is. It becomes very... Yeah crazy yeah. right if you've yeah. if you've got like if you've got room room noise it might mm -hmm. but it's easier to mitigate like okay like your computer's fan it's easier to take that out of the recording than it is like reflections from your room yeah when the actual yes. tone of your room and the, the voice bouncing off is one of the hardest things yes. to have mm -hmm. to get rid of in post and i would say it's like mm -hmm. there you can do it in ozone but it just kind of chops your vocal up and it's not not great and there's something yeah. to be said for like even look at looking at liz's window hanging curtains or fabric if you do know you have a lot of big belting anything you could do to your space to help dampen reflections mm -hmm. i find is great yeah. especially if you're in like in a in a basic apartment and there's nothing going on if you can't mm -hmm. record in a closet or something else do something to the corners to help all that bounce mm -hmm. back because yeah you're not recording just your voice mm -hmm. you're recording the room if you're doing that exactly 
Mm-hmm. And I have um, seen one, people uh, oops, list how far they want <laughs> you to be from your mic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, like to say, every everyone in the choir, make sure you're yeah. like two hand width lengths from your mic just because they want a little bit of that, like a consistent sound for the room. Yeah. Sorry, okay. Ensemble Go stuff, ahead. it's good to, yeah. con- to okay. actually put that in your instructions. Uh, Jay, mm-hmm. you had something? Yeah. I just wanted to add to the point uh, regarding, um, because, you know, I think when you're starting out as a, as a, as a vocalist and you want to record your audio and you want it to be as clean as possible, you don't have maybe the necessary, let's say like the money to get like super professional equipment. Honestly, you have, what you do have is you have your furniture that can really absorb the sound of the room. Um, in my case, my makeshift booth is literally like mattresses kind of like, Mattresses are too. great. Mattresses, nice. awesome. which are really, they really help a lot, you know, yeah. um, with, the, with the recording. So honestly, um, as long as you have something lying around that can help with, you know, reducing that kind of like absorbing the room noise, then honestly, I think uh, it's not like if you want to invest into something more professional, you can do that later on. But to start out, just mm-hmm. go use one of your things that you have lying around at home, pillows blankets mattresses i'm a big fan of moving moving blankets are so cheap you can actually get a pack of 20 on amazon sometimes for like 50 bucks and finding a way to hang those just to absorb like anything to help catch the bounce back um yeah i've recorded with a blanket over my head over the Mm -hmm. mic like in the most desperate of situations like Mm -hmm. even something like yeah i've been there too (laughs) I used a winter coat one time. I like zipped it up over my head and like put the microphone yes. on the inside. It was weirdly effective, I have to say. It really, it really does. It makes a difference. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I've been, I, I've actually been at like MagFest and Game Sound Con before, where I had a client thing come in where I had to record uh, while I was at a hotel. And if uh, it's always great if you have a room with two beds when you're traveling because you can use the mattresses and the pillows. And I set up a mini microphone and. I've lucked out that every room I've ever had has an ugly lounge chair in it. They always put like one of those little lounge chairs in the corner near the desk in the hotel room. And I found that I turn it upside down on top of the bed and you make this little vocal cove and you like your cord in your little vocal cove. And it's perfect mm. because that, that crummy chair has the padding in it and it mm. makes this cool little vocal alcove and you just stick your little mic in. So it's like, yeah, use what you got. Um, Exactly. No one cares what you did to record it. It's just how does it sound mm-hmm. in the end, right? That's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No one needs to know how the sausage gets made. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, let me see. It looks like uh, let's let, we can still talk a bit. And then there's some questions coming in. For those who are watching our, our feed, there is a question form. Uh, please send questions through there so we can easily access them because we are not physically looking at the Twitch stream. So please use the form. Uh, we have two in there so far. Uh, let's keep, we have a little more topic I think we can do for maybe five more minutes and then we can switch. Well, we, I know that in our pre-talk we discussed visuals and I think yes. maybe given oh, her yeah. experience, Laura can probably weigh in quite a bit on what <laughs> what happens if you're doing video with your, with your, with your choir. Okay, so oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I admittedly have never like tried to record a live, a live like a choir video before, mm-hmm. but like certainly with vocals, like there is no scenario where I support you trying to record the audio and the video at the same, like oh, if God, you have no. to for the purposes mm-hmm. of like, like zoom operas are very big right now. And like, I yeah. remember a friend was asking me like, yeah. I don't know how to record without gigantic headphones. And I was like, oh, well, why don't you just lip sync? And he was like, I can't. So they want me to like do it live. And I was like, mm. ah, okay. Earbuds. Well, mm. yep. Right. The earbuds was like, I was like, that's your best shot. Just take one yeah. out of your ear. And like, so you can hear the piano in the room. But yeah, like, you are not going to look as good like trying to like man- you know manage your microphone and you know mm-hmm. possibly like riding the distance and stuff yeah, like that and trying true. to listen to the track and trying to stay on click while trying to do video is the most awkward mm-hmm. thing in the world i do not support yes. it <laughs> i also, think it you, makes and way you can't more turn, sense just nobody you looks can't good turn doing pages no nope. you can't turn pages mm-hmm. without looking awkward and unless you have the whole yep, thing memorized yep. it, you could no. get a pedal you could get like if you have a tablet, you could get. You a could do the pedal. That's pedal. true. You could do the pedal. Yeah, I do but um, even then, though, your eyes go dead when you're thinking about hitting the pedal. Like it's <laughs> oh, yeah. just it's another like... thing. It's like <laughs> oh, I'm in it. Oh, I'm turning. Like everyone like, can tell out. that you're not with them anymore. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like 
in opera like we are far away from the stage for a frigging reason because uh, like opera singers we always look ridiculous when we're singing like i don't know if anybody can picture how nobody designed it to look good (laughs) it's Mm. tremendously awkward to be like singing like a romantic aria and like a guy is just singing directly into your face like it is not like it's not romantic at all we're all sweat like yeah yeah you got crazy eyes going on when you hit a high note so like Mm -hmm. if you're gonna do video just do it separately and lip sync it if if that's something that you can do and you will you will just feel so much better about your performance if you can separate those two things like rec- yeah. trying to manage re- self recording is already stressful enough without also, having to worry about video also hopefully give some direction because if you want if it's a serious piece and you want your singers to have a serious face great if you if it's fun and you're like a lot of the paper mario stuff you're like look like you're having a good time look happy you mm-hmm. know like woohoo i don't think oh, it's yeah. hot. and if yeah. you're like freaking out (laughs) if you want to make sure when you have your if you it's a choral piece and you get you end up with 30 pieces of footage from all these singers and maybe it's a serious piece and you've got like and then one guy's like "Ah." you want them to blend there's always a guy there's always a guy who's like always one guy Uh, you want it to be cohesive you want to make sure it's a pretty picture in the end um if it's not a silly piece have someone not bouncing around like a nutball yeah Mm. yeah yeah yeah. but if they say go silly go full body go silly yeah Um, yeah. that's a little bit the thing that i've noticed so i've actually had i've actually had the chance to do one of those like zoom call choirs actually really okay yes yes it was a lot of work i I was responsible for the video editing and um my Mm -hmm. uh my friend who is the choir director he was responsible for the audio yeah. Um, so it was really, it was quite the challenge because a lot of the, some of these, uh, uh vocalists, uh, choir members, they, they don't, they're not very tech savvy. Yeah. So for, I'll, they always mm-hmm. try to go for something that is the easiest for them. And of course that's where, you know, the phone and the audio mm-hmm. that goes with it, that, that is the easiest, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. so we had to go with that, you know? Um, but, uh, like you, Laura, I'm a firm believer that it's always great to, record audio separate from the video mm-hmm. which is why for some of the choir members I offered them the possibility to kind of schedule an appointment in my studio here so that they could actually film their performance oh. and have their audio sep- like recorded separately uh, you know before coming here of course you know mm-hmm. so um, of course uh, it's it's a little more challenging when it's like from people from different countries but yeah. when you're in this kind of like in the in the same area it becomes mm-hmm. a little bit easier as long as you respect uh, uh covid yeah. guidelines basically yes. but yeah. right yeah. <laughs> yeah i i would i would say like the only times where i have had to record uh, at the same time is specifically for scatting when you're improvising every single syllable on the fly, because that uh, is something in video after the fact is almost impossible unless you're going and transcribing every single syllable and what you did when to fake. And I've tried to fake it before. And my solution was to just put the, <laughs> put the, the, the windscreen, like right in front of my face, no, the pop filter in front of my face, and just be like, "You cannot see my lips, like, but I will an with my eyes." Yeah. You yes, the, you <laughs> did the anime trick. I'm having a really intense piece of dialogue. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> as long as your eyes are showing that you're into it, that's yeah. all they know, right? Oh well. Oh, God. Uh, Well, we're about, I think we have, ooh, we have 15 minutes left. Uh, I think we can start answering some questions, if that sounds good to you guys. We've got Mm -hmm. some questions on the feed. Uh, Let's see. Um, We can start with a theory one. Let's do that. Uh, Sean VGM asks, when I was taking theory one, my professor said some keys favor vocalists. Some are easier, like F sharp is easier than F major. Is this true or false and why? Also, a note: He has zero vocal experience himself. So I this think is so. Okay. <laughs> Anybody? Anyway, I think definitely because um, at least it, at least I've noticed in uh, church choir music, like a lot of the keys are in like D major, G major, stuff like that. But I mean, it it kind of depends on the melody, honestly. Like if you know what I mean, like it, it kind of depends on where the melody is going to go. Like I'm not sure mm-hmm. if like the key necessarily matters so much as like the contour. Um, mm-hmm. But I feel, feel free to jump in on that because I'm 
I'm not convinced. I'm just trying to think of, trying to think of no all the, 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 <laughs> the, mo well, okay. So this is, this is a poor example because a lot of the, I'm trying to reference like Mozart arias, which are tend to be like the ones that are meant to be nice and well, except for the impossible ones. We'll forget about those, but the, the, Mozart the baby, sometimes. the baby, <laughs> Mozart, right. But, mm -hmm. but we have to consider that the tuning system was different. So yeah. like what, see, like, okay, queen of the night would not have been that high. Mm. so <laughs> anyway forget about so forget about my thought there because I was like only oh, the tuning system's different so we can't really reference Mozart again <laughs> <laughs> I think oh. there's also should we also take into account the the mixing vocals because you have like the you know you know the different ranges where <clears throat> sorry about that um in the higher range you know you have the head voice and then you have the chest voice and then in this kind of like middle area like some people they struggle a lot you know just mm -hmm. kind of like switching from one to the other so i i don't know if that is taken into account as well yeah it depends on the type of music i think is what jn is getting at is that like yeah. you know if if it's like pop music like then you really have to rely on your mix if it's like you know operatic stuff uh, no actually you, you rely on the mix with that too so that's not even i, I wouldn't make that distinction actually but um but, but yeah, like it, it kind of just depends on like where the melody is going to go. So I don't, I don't think key is really the, the factor mm -hmm. here so much as like just the way the contour is operating. Mm -hmm. It can really affect how the arrangement will sound because uh, different keys will hit your singer's voices in different places. But mm -hmm. I think as to whether you can generalize like is F sharp easier than F, I don't think you can. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with that. Uh, we also have noted that Liz is frozen. We're trying to fix that on the back end. She can hear us. She can't. She just. But can't she looks great. Oh, she's supposed <laughs> she to look awesome. That's that a beautiful, beautiful, nice. yeah, beautiful hear freeze me. frame. <laughs> it's not what mine can would look like. Can you hear me? Like. We can hear you. We just hear <laughs> you. Just, you just have the. Luckily, you're frozen in a very nice pose. So huh. exactly. You, you want to refresh? So I had to refresh before. I have a spinning beach ball of death, so I'm not sure whether that would do anything. <laughs> Ooh, fun. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so this Liz... is just me, the cardboard cutout. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I guess let's see what else. What's, well, here's some other ones. Um, what's something you wish more composers, arrangers, knew about writing for voice? Are there anything? I think you... I I've got one that we meant to speak about, but the, and Annie Annie like kind of started speaking about it, but we didn't really go into that. The higher you go, the less comprehensible your words are going to get. So if you <laughs> want diction to be clear whatsoever, you cannot write way up in the stratosphere. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. Like it's just, it's just the way, the way that vowels, well, okay. So consonants, they take a certain amount of air to speak and we need the air to be moving fast when we're singing up high the other thing is mm -hmm. like thinking of a flute how they're nice and round and at least just like a tube our, our voices need to become more of a tube as we go higher and they need to become more compressed and like that are all, all our vowels round and sort of like this and so all the vowels become basically the same when yeah. you're, you're just like like Don't everything worry. right like it's all this <laughs> yeah, there's a very famous aria from if you guys want to see something really hilarious there is this famous aria from thomas addis's the tempest um just type that in plus soprano high and you'll probably find it and it's just the sub the text is on the bottom of the screen like subtitled and you can't understand a freaking oh. word this person is saying like it is ludicrously high like up like high e's high g's and stuff mm, like that but yeah. if i could piggyback on what uh, julia was saying is like acoustically like the phenome that like that the frequency that like defines a vowel sound there's a certain point where like a singer's voice gets higher than where that like that the, uh the, yeah that's oh, the that's formant, the right word. Like uh, the formant? formant yes yeah. that's the one i'm looking at um yeah. you get higher than that so like it's no longer affecting the vowel so like everything is just odd that no matter what shape your <laughs> mouth is making yeah. and boy howdy have i had to sing some songs or just you know like at the top of your range and like i i had to like tell the composer like you got to take it down like this is yeah. this is gonna sound stupid like it's gonna make your just, you know what i mean it'll just sound so much better if you just let me sing it you know uh a minor third down yeah. like you're gonna like oh. the piece will sound wonderful please <laughs> and, and some questions are coming in that are actually bouncing off this topic they're coming in right now one person did ask is it more difficult to sing quietly when you're singing in yep. a higher register oh yes. my god <laughs> yes. or, i'm gonna say <laughs> for most the answer people. is yes for most yeah. people, yeah, there are some 
like crazy people who can just live up there and float and be <laughs> like magnificent. Mm-hmm. And those are like rare breeds. They're if little, you they're are, you, if you are a train, unicorns. like unicorns. if, okay. I'm, I'm just trying to think back to uh, mm. a role, a role I did. It was Massane and he, he had this staccato and and then at the end of the phrase it was uh i think it was a d flat but it was meant to be pianissimo yeah and i'm just like here we go that and role is right mind after boggling. an e flat totally anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh and we have context we have a- is going to be important Oh yeah, it, and it I, wasn't. Yeah, right. And so with with that, I think because the voice was already kind of on that like staccato up in that whistle almost register, like mm-hmm. that 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 that, and then you could kind of float it. And so it depends on the, like the surrounding material. But if you want that right. note, like bang on out of nowhere, that's yeah. gonna be really, God really coming hard. coming yikes from me, dog. Like absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> Any, yeah, yeah. Anytime I mean, you just go like out of nowhere, there's this giant thing seven million ledger lines up. Uh, it helps <laughs> to at least give them some way to approach it, or the rest of the piece, you're not making them sing something completely different. Uh, we do have a male a question. They said many of the things we've been referencing up high are the opposite for males. Diction down low? Question mark? Ha ha! Exclamation mark. From decibel, decibel, fair. decibel. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. What's the question? As he's like talking about how this affects males, like writing stuff super low and expecting diction. Do the same types of things happen? Uh, yeah. Like you get a low bass, and you're like, here, you now have the melody line and a lot of text. Good, Good idea. Money. You know, I I don't mean to like jump in here with something like tangential, but I actually think we should probably start adopting language that's like lower voices first is higher voices because there, there's like a lot oh, of famous yeah. baritones that True. are are uh, women. In fact, so like yeah, like with, with like low voices that counter so, like, super duper low. Co- it, it counter diction can get or... absurd. Yeah, I know some yeah, altos yeah, could, that yeah, can go lower than like... a bass. My God, there are some yeah. really powerful just female baritones. Women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're like octavists, like Lucas those like Russian low Bunny. voices are like the, the basso profundo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, I love those. <laughs> I love those videos. <laughs> On they YouTube, just like just make like your body hum. <laughs> it's basically vocal fry, but like trained vocal. Yeah. Similar yeah. to how a counter tenor is like trained falsetto. Like it's oh god, it's vocal else. fry. Oh, gosh, counter tenors have... are fascinating. <laughs> I oh, love yeah. 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 When everyone starts singing, talking about singing with vocal fry, it just makes my, oh, oh, I'm like, oh, anytime you're asking for people <laughs> to intentionally sing with fry or a smoky voice, you have to be careful what you're asking for and how long you're asking them to sing with that tone. Cause that, yeah, yeah, dangerous. that's dangerous for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like the jazz world and the rock world versus the metal world and then the opera mm-hmm. world and going, mm-hmm. I want everyone to sound like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and all yeah. singers go no <laughs> <laughs> um, no thank you <laughs> you know, what, what do you want we'll just get kim k to sing the part we're good let's get eartha kit to do everything <laughs> it's like yes let's do it uh could i jump back one? to what do you wish oh, um oh i'm sorry yeah. no go ahead i i was gonna ask if we could jump back to what what do you wish composers knew about writing for the voice sure um that's why we're here yeah <laughs> cool. Okay, because I have uh, something I feel very strongly about is that um, when composers have the luxury of getting to know their singer, they should mm. do that, especially mm-hmm. if they're oh writing solistically. In a yes, choir, yes. it's not usually practical. Um, but as we were saying, because each voice is, you know, each voice is like each body, it's completely individualistic. Um, what you do for one person isn't going to work for another person. And the more True, you yeah. can work with your singer, the better they will sound and the better your music will sound. So yeah, like absolutely. open up the lines of communication and just keep them, keep them going. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's important to note that like, I don't know how common this is in like orchestral sessions, but like certainly when I've been working on new operas, like contemporary operas, it is very common for the composer to change the music, like based on like the singer that was like hired to sing the role, at least in, in my experience, like working with like grassroots opera companies, like, if like uh, you know that you you hired a singer to sing the role and they're just like having trouble with this one spot like uh, the composer has often just changed the music to like support like what that yeah. singer's voice does better um which it's not always true for every opera but like certainly for people who are not as experienced writing i think you would do well to like really listen to the singers and just like accept the knowledge on the at least your first couple of operas <laughs> until oh, you like get the hang of writing for it it's it's so important just what exactly what annie said to like get to know them and like uh, what their voice does best and so on i oh. i remember i have a distinct uh story that when we were doing super smash opera 
um, we had Jesse Buddington, a tenor, singing uh, new words to Le Donne Mobile. And we asked him how he felt about the cadenza at the end. And he was like, it's fine as long as it's not on an eval. And we're like, ooh, it's the word <laughs> Luigi. Luigi. And he's, Luigi. Like, <laughs> and he's just like, he sighs. And he's like, oh. I'll just figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, let your singer modify the vowel um, mm -hmm. to to be singable to them, because he did figure it out, and it was it was perfectly legible. But like, it's not going to be E G. It's going to be mm -hmm. Luigi. Luigi. Yeah, he's like <laughs> Luigi. Luigi. <laughs> Luigi. Oh, oh, we have a we have a mixing yes, question. If we're up, I've actually that. got a good answer for this one. I think the mixing because I do I do it lots. But yeah, uh, I'll I'll read the question and you can answer it. Uh, from Acapella VGM, we have a mixing question. I struggle to make voices sound distinct in choral multitracks, especially when it's all my own voice. It all kind of sits in the same EQ space. Any tips for adding variety in the mix? So, yeah, this is a struggle because you can't make it sound as big normally as like a regular choir of different voices would be if you're just doing yourself. So my trick here, well, there's a couple things. You can use uh, vocal doublers and things like that, and what they do a lot of them is they will uh, both double your tracks that you've already recorded and then add some kind of modulation to it, which mm. means some kind of changing effect so that it yeah. sounds more like warmer or lighter. Yeah. And, so, yeah. so whether that's like a pitch modulation thing, because your voices would not all be dead on the exact same pitch. Um, you could in your performance slightly darken or so mm -hmm. slightly brighten your timbre mm -hmm. purposefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could go into Melodyne if you have access to such a program and not make sure everything is the exact same pitch. You could make some slightly sharp, some slightly not too much so that you're changing the actual pitch a mm -hmm. little bit so you get that chorusing effect. Um, mm -hmm. And you can go into the formant change in Melodyne as well. And that will actually change the the timbre as well. So you can pop the, the formant, which is it really contributes to the how like squeaky or how deep a voice is even if they're on the same pitch. So just doing those little things without mm -hmm. having to go into each one and like EQ it differently or crazy things like that. Like I, I yeah. find that to be helpful for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, when it's all you, it's like the, th the thing you want to avoid is making it seem like you're in a synthesizer and you would just hit the, the chorus button. It's like you mm -hmm. have to, I know whenever I've had to do guide tracks or send somebody like they want three layers of your curl track and it should sound like different people. I kind of invent like the church lady uh, the eager high school person and myself. So I try to have like the rounded, more, more warm version of my voice, a high version and my normal voice. So at least they get three things that blend. Cause otherwise, mm -hmm. if you just send three tracks of your normal person, it, yeah, it just doesn't, it's those, you need those tweaks. You need those tone tweaks mm -hmm. to sound like a group. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I used to do in the past, and I don't think that's something I should recommend at all, <laughs> but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to so I used to actually um whenever I did different like um because I wanted some you know different tone to the to the voices that I would sing I would actually change the pitch of the track and then kind of sing the melody wow. and then oh, actually I would have That's amazing. The... <laughs> that's really interesting. I've never that's thought a, of that before. I've never thought a, of doing that either. A, so you would then bounce then you would change it later and then it's still Yes. And then the voices actually would like change in pitch like when you when you adjust that's the, scene, the original pitch. That's a really good idea. That is so cool. That's I'm how like, we can, that's how we can do our that's how we can sing tenor now. There I'm we go. Yeah. I can be but, a bass. Oh my now. gosh! We're just thinking of that. We saw. Yeah, all I right, mean, you just won the panel. The past, but <laughs> the the only thing is that you, you can kind of like I think if you can, you know, like uh, if you make your your main voice prominent and then the other voices like kind of like you know not as prominent, I think you can get away with that. You know, mm -hmm. because if you listen to those tracks individually, you can hear how different the pitches are. So. <laughs> My goodness. I love that. I like it's, that's an I awesome trick. something from our own panel today. <laughs> I've learned something from every panel this week. I've weekend. learned so much. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, like, it's a whole conference. <laughs> well then, we've just Fantastic. solved how to do choir. <laughs> there we go. Um, we still have a couple other questions, but we have like one minute or less left. 
So um, I think we'll just uh, we'll end we'll end close up here and uh, thank you everyone who came to watch our panel live today. Thank you to our fabulous panelists for all of our wealth of information. Hopefully, all the choir arrangers, future choir arrangers, singers, and those who didn't know they wanted to learn about vocals enjoyed our talk today. Um, if you want to keep asking us <laughs> questions, we're gonna talk. We're gonna take our uh, answers down to the Discord. You can chat with us for a little bit in the live stream sh uh, channel under that panels dash discussion. Uh, there's still a couple of questions that came in on the forum. We can address those and any other stuff that comes up and we're happy to talk to you. So thanks again, everyone. Have a lovely end of VGM together. And, Just and I, think I am waving. Liz is totally <laughs> waving, even though she's frozen. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be Liz's Thanks hand everyone. waving. I think we'll keep waving until they tell me that we're stopped. Hello.